So our next investigation is to determine in the linear sampling receiver what strategy would be optimal for the choice of the filter in the uh, receiver. And we will uh, learn that a filter that is matched, matched to the transmitted waveform, will be the best strategy. So let's go through that now. Uh, by the way, the matched filter is covered in section 3.2.2 in our Sklar uh, textbook. So again, here is a repetition. We've recreated again the uh, block diagram for the linear sampling receiver. Three steps, a filter, sampling, and then the decision. And uh, we've covered the decision strategy, what to use for the um, threshold. And now we're going to be focusing on the filter instead. So what frequency response should we use? Uh, we've looked before in the time domain, but we're going to be looking in the frequency domain for this uh, part of the analysis. So again, it's after the output is sampled here that we go into the uh, decision box. So there is in the uh, test statistic, there is a contribution from the signal and a contribution from the noise. And again, we're going to be looking at this um, two types of contribution to the test statistic to come up with a, a good strategy. So how do we choose H of F? We'll start with the signal. What I'm going to look for in the signal is how much power there is. Because we can think of the um, filter having an impact on how much power is allowed to come through from the signal and how much power is allowed to come through from the noise. And intuitively, we would like more power to be in the signal and less power to be in the noise. The most we can force that with this free choice we have of a filter, the better our um, performance will be. So let's look at that signal. What is the instantaneous power at the output of the filter? So here is our choice, what we're trying to determine, what should we use for our receive uh, filter, and here is our signal. And of course, it's being sampled uh, at the sampling time. So I can evaluate this um, convolution more easily in the frequency domain than I can in the time domain. It's a little more difficult to do uh, in the um, um, time domain. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my Fourier analysis uh, that tells us that um, if I take um, S convolved with H, that it has a Fourier transform, which is uh, S of F multiplied by H of F. So the Fourier uh, transform of S has capital S. Fourier transform of the filter is the filter response, which is capital H. So here in the middle here, that is this product. Now if I want to do go from the frequency domain back to the time domain, well, I have to do the inverse Fourier transform. So basically this integral here is the inverse Fourier transform. So I know convolution is equivalent to multiplication in the frequency domain. So I multiply in the frequency domain. But now, you know, I have to go back to the time domain if I want to know what AI of capital T is. I'm going to, whatever the time is, I'm going to evaluate it at capital T. Okay, so that's the trick I'm going to use. Now, every time I see a lowercase t, I'm going to replace it with a capital T. So that happens just in here, nowhere else. So here, um, that is now a capital T. So that's the contribution uh, from the signal. And the instantaneous power would be this value squared. So I would take this integral and square it. So I said you know, it was easier than doing the convolution, but it's not really obvious here. But we're going to see that we have a trick that's going to let us uh, um, uh, exploit this representation from the frequency domain to, to make it easier to, to examine how we we're going to maximize the signal power versus the noise power. So I've looked at the signal. Now it's time to look at the noise. In noise, it's a random process. So it's the power spectral density that is going to determine um, how much uh, power is in the noise at the output. So we have a linear time invariant system. This is our linear receiver. It has a frequency response of H of F. 
Now our input signal, it's got some power spectral density. We'll call that Gx of f. And we know that the power spectral density at the output of the filter is going to be uh, the input power spectral density and uh, the module squared of the filter. Okay, so again, I've got some noise process, noise going in to a filter, and this noise has got some power spectral density, right? And when it comes out, you know, what's the power spectral density of this filtered noise? Well, there's a relationship from probability, um, well, from Fourier analysis, probability theory, join them together. <laughs> we get this result that says that I take the frequency response squared, multiply it by the power spectral density at the input, and I get this. So Fourier analysis tells us this. So what is the noise power spectral density at the input? Well, it's additive white Gaussian noise. So the input is flat. That's what additive white Gaussian noise is. Additive white Gaussian noise, we've seen earlier, it's got a frequency power spectral density, which is just constant at n0 over 2. So it's constant for all frequencies, it's completely infinite support. It's right there. So here we have gx of f, it's not really a function of f, it's constant for all f, it's just n0 over 2. So that means that our output is just n0 over 2, and it's completely determined by the module squared of our filter. So for noise, a random process, I'm interested not in instantaneous power, but in the average power. And so I can calculate this noise from the input uh, power spectral density, which is this constant uh, f, the power spectral density after filtering is again given by this expression and the average power then would just be uh, the integral over all of the f. So let's say that my h of f you know, had some shape as my h of f. Since my, I'm just multiplying it, let's say that this is the shape squared. Then if I'm just multiplying by the constant, it's the same. And now I want to know how much power there is. Well, that's the area under the curve, right? Because this is the power spectral density spread over all frequencies, and I want to know the total power. Total power would be the integral from minus infinity to infinity of this um, output power spectral density. From now, I'm going to concentrate on the signal to noise ratio. I want to make the signal bigger. I want to make the noise smaller. And you know, combining the two, I want this ratio to be as large as we can. And what freedom do we have? We have the freedom to choose any h of f that we wish. So we're looking for an h of f that is actually going to maximize the signal to noise ratio. What is the signal to noise ratio? Well, in the top, I put the instantaneous signal power. And in the bottom, I put the um, noise power, average noise power. So I, here was the, Fourier the inverse Fourier transform. That's what we had here, squared. Uh, that's the signal power, and in the denominator, we have the noise power, which was the area under the curve of the impulse uh, h of f uh, module squared. So we can see here h of f is the free variable that we're using, and we want to maximize this expression. So how do we do that? Uh, there's a very nice inequality we can use to help us find this um, maximization. And that is known as the Schwartz inequality. So the Schwartz inequality in general is when I have the product of two functions, uh, which is integrated and squared. This will always be less than uh, integrating the module squared of each one of these functions and then multiplying them together. When I achieve equality in this inequality is when each of these two functions is pretty much identical. Um, when g1 of x is g2 of x complement, the um, complex uh, conjugate, uh, and there could be any k factor, it doesn't matter, it would, it would still give equality no matter what that k factor is. Okay, so we have Schwartz's inequality, looks like it's bang on what we're going to need, uh, and we even know the criteria for equality. So what are we going to do? We're going to um, 
assign values to this g1 of x and g2 of x. So we define that the g1 is going to be our, what we're looking for, the h of f. And the g2, well, we're going to make that uh, what's left in this num numerator. So h of f is our g1. So our g2 will be that s of f and that x complex exponential. So I've defined my g1 and my g2. Now I just plug them into uh, Schwartz's inequality. So the inequality is telling us that um, in the left side, we have this inverse uh, Fourier transform. And on the right side, we have uh, what is the numerator we're looking for. And we also have to uh, multiply that by uh, this uh, extra term, which we haven't seen before. So this is looking like our signal power. This is contributing to our noise power. Uh, but then this, this part from Schwartz's inequality, what does that, what does it, it mean? Well, first of all, exponents, uh, complex exponential like that does not change the module squared. The module squared of the complex exponential is one, so it's not multiplying by one. So essentially, this is just the, um, the energy in the uh, signal waveform. So I picked a waveform, and that waveform has a certain amount of, of energy with it. But it's, it's fine. It's just like a, a, a normalization constant, if you will. So let's go back to Schwartz's inequality now that we've done our assignment. And it's showing us this result, that this is the inequality. Here I have the product. The fact that there's an exponential doesn't change anything because it just went to one here. And now I want to isolate what is the signal to noise ratio. And it says that the signal to noise ratio is always going to be bounded by this value of you know, the energy in the signal. So the, ener the output signal energy divided by the noise will always be constrained to be less than the, the signal originally, which you know, makes sense. So I want to choose h of f that lets this signal to noise ratio be as large as possible. So it's always constrained to be smaller than this value. So the largest value will be the h of f that achieves equality. So what I'm looking for, um, oh, I guess I should have put that factor of n0 over 2, but that doesn't really change anything. Um, so what I'm looking for is the equality criteria. So that's where I want to choose um, h of f, basically equal to the signal waveform, but uh, the complex conjugate and some multiplicative factor. For this reason, we call this filter the matched filter, because it is matched to the signal waveform. So whatever choice I make for the signal waveform, and it can be any signal waveform, it's going to be normalized, like there's some energy in the signal, and you know, it's the energy I have available to me. And whatever waveform I do, you know, I'm going to multiply by that maximum energy. So I have a certain shape that I chose to transmit. So my receiver, what should its strategy be? Well, whatever shape I use to transmit my data, well, the receiver should use the exact same shape. It should match to it, and that will maximize the signal to noise ratio, which of course will make our performance as good as it can be. So uh, the match filter um, is, if we look in the time domain, here's the relationship in the frequency domain. It's basically a multiplicative factor. It's the conjugate, and there is some um, uh, ex complex exponential. If I look now, what does that mean in the time domain? This is what the frequency response should look like. What should the, the impulse response look like? Well, I would just take the inverse Fourier transform. And of course, there's just this multiplicative factor stays the same, this k. But the fact that I had a complex exponential multiplying in the frequency domain is the equivalent of a um, shift in time. So it's a time shift. So basically, if I have the form of, let's say, like this, is my pulse for some reason, then I should do just a reflection and a delay of uh, uh, this, this function. So what was 0 and t, it simply uh, gets flipped in this, in this version, the 0 there. 
Um, this is time to me. So this is a sort of assuming that I have some shape where the pulse is time limited and it's zero outside of that, that time impulse uh, under that um, symbol interval. So to summarize, we've now seen uh, what the filter should be. The filter should have an impulse response, which is basically just the flipped, time flipped and shifted version of the uh, transmitted symbol. And the decision, we've seen that the threshold should just be the midpoint of the two means. Uh, so this is for the binary case. Now, there is a little bit tricky going on here. I said there's a couple of things that could have been uh, transmitted. It could have been an S0, could have been an S1. Of course, S0 and S1, are, they're, they're different. If they were the same, they'd be the same symbol. So when I say I match, well, which one do I match it to? Uh, I have to match it to the, the waveform used for transmission. But do I match it to the one or do I match it to the zero? Well, it's actually uh, not that complicated. And so let's have a look at how we would do it. Do we match to S0? Do we match to S1? And what we do is we think about what we're doing in this decision box. So suppose I take the receive signal and I have one that is matched to a one being transmitted and one that is being matched to the zero being transmitted. Now at the output of each of these two receivers, uh, two filters, um, I can sample and I would get a different test statistic. I have a test statistic when I am matched to symbol one and I have a test statistic from when I was matched to zero. And clearly, um, you know, I'm maximizing the signal to noise ratio when it was a one transmitted, maximizing the signal to noise ratio here when it was a zero transmitted. So at the end, I'm going to have two test statistics, and I should choose the larger one. Which one has a better signal to noise ratio? It sort of assumes that the two signals, the zero and the one, have the same signal energy when they're being transmitted um, in this particular case. But the important thing is just the concept that I, I have to match, and if I have more than one symbol, I match to each symbol. <laughs> in the binary case, there's two, so I match to each one. I get out two test statistics, and now my comparison with the threshold, well, they each have a different mean, right? So it's comparing one to the other is the equivalent of this strategy that we developed previously, which is to compare it to the midpoint. So choose the largest uh, is the uh, correct output. So we use a match filter, match to each one of the binary uh, waveforms, and then at the output we choose whichever one is larger. Now you might think, well, it's a shame we have two uh, different branches, we have twice as much complexity, we have two filters. But that's not true because we can do an equivalent one. Here I have an equivalent fil um, filter and that equivalent filter is just the difference between the first two. So I have H1 minus H0. That means that I have a new test statistic which is this the difference between the Z1 and Z0. So remember if Z1 was bigger I would choose the largest. Well if Z1 is bigger that means that the difference between Z1 and Z0 will be positive. So now when I use this new equivalent filter, my strategy is just to choose one if the uh, Z um, hat, the combined one, is larger. And so actually in the binary case, it is not more complex. It's just that it ends up that the, if we have signals of equal energy, that we would actually match to the difference between the two of them.